and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him says the Lord Alleluia 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 The Lord be with you I'm reading from the Holy Gospel according to John Jesus said to the crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord in today's Gospel is setting himself up to be rejected. We know soon after this passage, the disciples, not, not a lot of them remain. And Peter is the only one left with the rest of the apostles. And Jesus says, are you too going to leave? And he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of everlasting life. Our Lord must have known, though, that these words that he was saying would lead to rejection. Because he seems to be purposely trying to shock his audience. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. What is this man saying? Is he saying to cannibalize him? This should sound more than just awkward. This should sound repulsive. It makes sense that they would have uh, an issue with this. When they clarify and say, how can this man say this? Jesus doubles down and says, not only have to, should you eat my flesh and drink my blood, but you should chew on my flesh. The word he uses for eat is trogo, which apparently in Greek means to more than just to eat, but to chew, to masticate, to put in between your teeth and grind. Do this to my flesh. <laughs> I'm not speaking merely figuratively. I'm giving you my flesh for the life of the world. This is happening, and you have to do it. <laughs> he must have known that not all of them would have received this word with so much docility. <laughs> Understandably, almost. Why would Jesus allow himself to be rejected? Isn't this communion that we speak of a communion in his body? a union with God that all of us are to share with him. Why would he speak about this great gift of himself and the Eucharist in a way that's going to lead to his rejection? It helps to know, uh, to understand what a sacrament is and how a sacrament works. A sacrament is not an automatic thing for us where God just says, hey, here's some grace, easy, free grace. Hey, you want to be baptized? Here, I'll pour some water over you and now you're baptized. You want to, you know, you want to receive my life and have eternal life in you? Here, here's, here's Jesus, you know, take him and go. It's not an automatic thing. Sacraments are not a vending machine. <laughs> they require our participation. They require us to respond to the demands of the sacrament. Our baptism is accompanied by baptismal promises, which we have to live out for the entirety of our lives. And if we do not follow those promises, we do have no longer experience God's grace. If we fall out of the state of grace, God is no longer with us in the same kind of way. Same thing with the Eucharist. 
if we live in accordance with the Eucharist, if we offer ourselves with him in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, we will experience great graces. But if we reject him, we will not. And if we receive our Lord sacramentally, when we are not prepared, when we are not in the state of grace, we, as St. Paul says, receive condemnation upon ourselves. Our Lord knew this. He knew that self sacraments worked, that there are two sides of a coin. There's blessings and there's curses. And he gave himself anyway for us. He poured himself on us, even knowing that some of us would not accept it, and some of us will turn the other way. This is because of God's greater plan, the way that God works when he acts within humanity. Every time God acts, it is marked by an excessiveness that we find hard to believe. You know, the feeling of wonder when you look up at a night sky and wonder about all the different stars that we see and all the stars we don't see, the galaxies that are out there. It is so excessive. It is almost wasteful that God would create so much when it didn't seem to make sense to us. It is completely gratuitous that God would do that. Well, when God pours out his grace, it's the same kind of thing. It is excessive. When he pours out his love, he does not hold back. When he pours out his blood, he doesn't measure it. He gives everything. God on the cross offered himself entirely for us. The church fathers say that one drop of Christ's blood would have been enough. That all of us could have been forgiven with one drop of his blood. In fact, some even say that he could have just willed it, that we'd all be forgiven. He didn't even have to suffer and to die. But he did. Because when God gives, he gives everything. It's a complete gift of himself, an emptying of himself that does not hold back, and there's no limit to it. We need this. We need this because we know our sinfulness. We know how much we're capable of rejecting God, who's infinitely good to us. So we need to know that his mercy is infinite. God's ways are always excessive in our minds. But this is how God works, and we need this. Just as with the Holy Eucharist, where it could be both a sacrament of communion for the souls that are disposed, and a sacrament of rejection, a sacrament of condemnation, so too with the other sacraments. This week, we've been hit as a church with startling, uh, a startling accounts of the great evil perpetrated by many members of the church, many priests of the church. Priests who were ordained to be conduits to Christ. Priests who were configured to Christ crucified in a powerful way through the grace of ordination. Priests who ended up turning their back on that ordination, falling into sin, falling into crimes, damaging people really, really awfully. How do we deal with this? How do we understand this? Aren't these priests supposed to be men of God? Well, just like in the Eucharist, where it could be a sacrament of condemnation, so too with the priesthood. A priest is ordained to be a sign of hope. He's meant to live like we live in heaven. He's meant to be configured to Christ and his cross. But when he acts on his own, apart from God, when he goes down a route that leads to tremendous hurt and pain, he becomes an obstacle. He's no longer a sign of hope. He is a sign of despair. He blocks people from coming into contact with Christ. He pushes them away. It does tremendous damage to the body of Christ. Priests have a tremendous responsibility to bring souls to Christ. Christ has entrusted human beings as living instruments, capable of cooperating with God's grace or rejecting it. I think it's more important for us right now to pray for priests. They do have a great responsibility, but a great heaviness hangs over their heads right now. I say this especially as a somewhat newly ordained priest, how tough it is to be a priest in today's world. How tough it is with the allegations out there against brother priests. How disgusted I am. How much it exhausts me. All these priests experience this. 
They need prayers deeply. Those faithful priests that are meant to be conduits of Christ. Also, too, if we can pray for, especially for those that were victimized, those that have been hurt irreparably, those that need healing, that God's grace might shine on them in a particular way to bring about that healing. We pray for all those in the church, like ourselves, that feel betrayed by our priests, that feel betrayed by our hierarchy. We might offer ourselves in union with Christ crucified. It's a good idea, and it goes, it's a traditional notion, but it's a good one to offer our Holy Communion for those that need the prayers the most. I recommend, if you have not, do not have an intention for this Mass, if you do not have anyone that you're praying for in particular, to offer your Holy Communion and, so that those graces that you receive might pass through you for those that need it most in this crisis, for the victims, for good, solid priests that have done nothing wrong, for the priests that have done terrible things and need to know serious, serious repentance, for the bishops, for those that are struggling to make things right, for all the faithful. If you can offer your communion today at this Mass, that'll go a long way. We have to make sure that we do not become one of those that leave Christ in the midst of crisis. We cannot turn away from the cross now that is right in front of us. This shower of mercy that comes from Christ's side needs to pass through us to the rest of the world. Will you let him work through you? Will you unite yourself ever more closely to him in Holy Communion for the good of the church?